on, we would love to invite Azra Ismail and Neha Kumar to give our last talk, but not the last in this series. And uh, before we, so Azra is a, Azra Ismail is a PhD candidate in human center computing at the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. Her research lies at the intersection of human center computing and global health. Uh, we would also like to invite Nia Kumar. Nia Kumar is an assistant professor. Uh, sorry, uh, now the position might have changed. Sorry, uh, is a professor at Georgia Tech, uh, USA, where she conducts research at the intersection of human center computing and global development. We would like to congratulate Neha for her new position. They are going to speak on human centered design of artificial intelligence systems for frontline health. Thanks, Pranjal. I can go ahead and get us started. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Neha Kumar, and I'm newly associate professor at uh, Georgia Tech, where I do work at the intersection, uh, as Pranjal said, uh, HCI and global development. And a lot of that work focuses on uh, global health, the social, social and, and cultural determinants of, of global health. And uh, the work that we've been doing in the space of human-centered design of AI is led by Azra, and this is uh, the focus of her PhD dissertation. So I would also like uh, her to be uh, to, to introduce herself, Azra. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, Azra, a third year PhD student at Georgia Tech, working with Neha. Um, I think Neha uh, has described my work already, but um, I, I work on uh, the design of uh, AI systems for frontline health. Um, so we've already heard uh, a good number of talks that uh, that have exposed us to the challenges that AI systems encounter and bring as we think about global south uh, settings. Um, sorry, do you need to? I think it's recording. I just saw the message pop up. Um, and, and also the potential that some of these systems uh, have to offer. And one of these spaces where there's been a lot of AI activity uh, is the field of global health. And this has also become the center of public conversations uh, as a result of the pandemic that we've been in for the last year. So um, uh, Azra and I will talk about the need for human-centered design of these AI systems. And uh, our focus is on the urban Indian context. So next slide. Um, so there is uh, a well-known fable by Mullah Nasruddin, who was a Turkish poet and philosopher, and it goes something like this. So there's a man who's walking home late one night, and he sees Mullah Nasruddin looking for something under a streetlight. And uh, he says, Mullah, what have you lost? And uh, the Mullah responds, I'm searching for the key to my house. So the man tries to help, and after searching for some time, he asks again, so tell me, Mullah, where did you, do you remember where exactly you dropped the key? And uh, Mullah Nasri then uh, points to the darkness and says, over there in my house, I lost the key inside my house. And so the passerby, uh, he shouts frustrated, then why are you searching for the key on the street? And the Mullah responds, because there's more light here than inside my house. Um, right, and this this is a fable that we hear often. It's also referred to as a streetlight effect, uh, referring to observational bias, and it effectively illustrates an important point that uh, we frequently look for things or solutions where they're uh, easiest to find, not necessarily where they might reside, and. Um, uh, this has been talked about in the context of technologies. Um, uh, Aruna Roy had brought this up at the last ICTD conference that happened uh, in India. And uh, in the space of big data, Mark Moritz has uh, written about this, um, uh, saying, uh, without checking uh, facts on the ground, researchers may fool themselves into thinking that their big data models accurately represent the world that they aim to study. So next slide. 
this is also true in the case of uh, AI applications that are being applied towards global health. So there's multiple stakeholders and many challenges that are experienced by these holders, uh, stakeholders that are uh, systemic and that have to do with uh, politics, power hierarchies, gendered and social norms, uh, complex knowledge systems and more. And uh, viewing these from a purely technical lens can lead to context collapse. And this is also what we found uh, or what we've heard about in other talks today. Um, the highlight remains on a narrow challenge that can be addressed with AI rather than messy multi-stakeholder and systemic uh, challenges. So next slide. Um, efforts to advance uh, AI in global health have only multiply, multiplied in this last year during the pandemic. Uh, AI systems have been used to determine who gets vaccinated or for cough-based diagnosis and disease forecasting. And now more than ever, uh, we need to address concerns and skepticism around the use of AI and data-driven approaches. Some questions that we ask of AI systems being deployed. So number one, who will be using the AI systems? And many of these are motivated by the shortage of ex expert human and technical resources in underserved settings, and they rely on lower level workers. The second uh, question is where is the data coming from and how is it being collected? So extensive data is being collected for reporting purposes and disease surveillance, but this doesn't always happen with informed consent. And as Shaima also mentioned in her talk, you know, it's, uh, th the quality of the data is, uh, uh, is, is central to the quality of the AI. And, uh, uh, the, the, the possibility of collecting data has been made possible by the widespread use of mobile technologies and the internet, but uh, what good this data is, is, is still uh, a contentious issue. And finally, how does AI fit into the broader ecology and existing work practices? So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the third question. And so moving to the next slide. Um, we focus on the view from the front lines uh, in our work that has been uh, led by Azra. And the AI systems mentioned uh, would require someone to collect data, use the application, or implement its recommendations. And in many cases, uh, the users are the frontline health workers, right? So these frontline health workers are employed in many countries across the global south, uh, also in the global north and uh, primarily in uh, underserved settings, um, especially in India, uh, they were introduced as a result of the Millennium Development Goals uh, to, to try and achieve the health outcomes that were laid out by these goals. And uh, these are workers who serve as an individual's first point of contact with the healthcare system and um, provide care directly to their community. So including nurses, midwives, community health workers, doctors, pharmacists, and more. And the COVID-19 pandemic has brought attention to how uh, these workers are overburdened, most of whom are underpaid women. So with that, I'm going to ask Azra to, uh, to describe the, uh, the research that she did. Thank you, Neha. Um, so as HCI researchers, we were interested in understanding the gaps and opportunities for design in AI for frontline health. Uh, and this is also the focus of our upcoming paper at CHI 2021. To do this, we drew on data from two main sources, an extensive literature review and an extended ethnography from an underserved part of Delhi in India. The literature review surveyed the landscape of AI for global health. Um, or to borrow, borrow the analogy from earlier to understand where the light is currently illuminated. We reviewed 347 academic papers, white papers, and other gray literature to identify applications that are currently being proposed, uh, predominantly in the global south. We then took an ethnographic approach to further identify the gaps in current efforts or to, uh, to investigate the dark. Um, we collected data from a Muslim majority region of Delhi that has been identified to be at high risk by the uh, government of Delhi. This is a region where we have been conducting field work with in multiple phases over the last three years. We draw on data from interviews, focus groups, 
and non-participant observation that we conducted in clinics and during home visits with uh, accredited social health activists or ASHAs. Uh, these are um, ASHAs are women frontline health workers who are tasked with providing reproductive health and maternal and child health care at the last mile in India. They also attend to primary health care concerns uh, in their communities and also do a lot of data collection in their everyday work. The data and workflows are uh, also becoming uh, increasingly uh, digital, um, as has been the case with other health workers in India and, and also outside India. I'll first share some of the key themes that uh, came out of our literature review. So what we found is that most of the AI applications for frontline health were from South Asia, followed by Latin and Central America uh, and Africa. Uh, we found that most of these efforts were actually led by researchers from the global south, so either in terms of the researcher's place of origin or where the institute is located. Um, and applications we reviewed included uh, applications for disease surveillance, diagnostics and screening, risk assessment, epidemiology, resource allocation, behavior prediction, information delivery, and uh, data quality control. Uh, despite all of these uh, different kinds of uh, uses, over 70% of the AI applications just focus on two cases, which were disease forecasting and diagnosis. A deeper analysis uh, of the literature revealed uh, several concerns. So we found um, across the board uh, uh, limited engagement with local stakeholders, even when the researcher was led by uh, local institutions. And the discussion of AI systems typically ended with assumptions about who was expected to take up the system. So for instance, there's this uh, quote from one of the papers that states, um, uh, since malaria is preventable and treatable, one of the solutions uh, would be to uh, implement an effective malaria outbreak early warning system. This way, policymakers can put mitigation measures in place. Though policymakers might use the system, um, they don't actually implement at the last mile. This is typically lower level frontline workers who are called upon in such situations. And we found little discussion about the impact on their existing practices. In many of the applications that we reviewed, it was also unclear who was expected to act on the recommendations of the system and how. So for instance, with diagnostic and screening tools, it's worth asking who is expected to be doing the screening and, and uh, the follow-up. Many workers are already overburdened. Um, there's also a chance of missing sociocultural dimensions of health and diverting attention away from other conditions that uh, may be more pressing. One paper that we reviewed was exceptional uh, in that it considered implications for screening. Um, and this was in the case of cervical uh, cancer in uh, Kenya, where they recognized that uh, there's an ethical problem to identifying precancerous lesions if you can't do anything about them. And the paper went on to suggest that they could, uh, went on to suggest a solution that could actually be acted upon by nurses, but this was uh, an exceptional case. Some of the applications that we reviewed for risk assessment and epidemiology were particularly troubling. Uh, one system deployed in Argentina had a policymaker claiming uh, that with technology based on name, surname, and address, you can predict five or six years uh, ahead which girl or teenager is 86% predestined to have a teenage pregnancy. Another case that aimed to address sexually transmitted diseases stated um, to provide customized education and training to women in developing and underdeveloped regions. It's necessary to classify women in those regions into different health risk segments and subgroups uh, within the, the segment. And this was work uh, being done in India. So such systems attempt to take into account sociocultural dimensions of health, but this is happening at a very superficial level and can actually end up reinforcing historical biases against certain communities. Health workers instead actually have a deeper understanding of the challenges and can do risk assessments on a more informed basis by actually taking into account uh, existing health practices, their own past uh, history of experiences working with a specific household and their, and their uh, understanding of the different uh, kinds of politics at play. There were also other themes that uh, came out of a literature review, which I will not get into in the interest of time. Uh, but this included concerns about data sources uh, and a reliance on data and computation heavy AI models. 
Next, uh, I will rely on the ethnographic data to shed light on the gaps that emerge when we look at the broader ecology. So first let's focus on the view of the healthcare seeker. We need to recognize that these systems would be situated within a broader co complex ecosystem that determines how healthcare seeking happens. And this is clear in this quote from Naima, a resident that we interview, interviewed. Uh, she says, I generally go to the doctor when my children fall sick. My children fall sick often um, and, and um, uh, I take them to a chota mota or small time doctor. Uh, they charge less, um, but the medicines are not very effective. Um, I will end up going to the uh, to a better doctor, like a pedi pediatrician, and the medicines they give are very effective, and I don't need to visit the doctor again. But I will have to get a number and then wait until my name is called. I can't take time off from work to take my kids to the government dispensary. Um, so, so we see a, a couple of uh, different factors that uh, that uh, are at play uh, uh, and inform how Naima decides where to seek healthcare. Uh, for her, the most accessible point was these small-time doctors in her neighborhood. These doctors did not always have the uh, best medical expertise, uh, and and in fact, this could be a place where AI uh, tools could play a role. Um, and and that was something that we uh, did not see. Uh, in our AI discourse, th these actors were not uh, well represented. Uh, we also see that Naima is more likely to seek care for her kids than for herself. Uh, and systems for information delivery could target needs that uh, someone like Naima might not choose to go to a doctor for. Um, and, and the long wait times uh, at clinics, uh, that's another place where AI could play a role to help with better scheduling. Of course, all of these are subject to constraints around digital access. Uh, and digital literacies, which are constantly changing. Now let's look at the perspective of lower level healthcare providers. Uh, and I will share a story of uh, Asha Hiba uh, from a measles outbreak uh, as an example. So Asha Hiba had just seen her daughter off to school when her phone beeped. Uh, on the WhatsApp group with other Ashas and supervisors uh, was a message all Ashas, please report to the dispensary for, for a quick meeting. Um, when she uh, rushed to the dispensary, she found that two Ashas nearby had found cases of measles. All of the Ashas had to now go to all the 400 or so households in their areas and uh, find and report cases of measles. So in the following week, Hiba visited as many homes as she could uh, to find cases of measles. Uh, and, and in these cases, she had to uh, uh, sort of combine her other duties as well. And, and this was work that was not uh, paid. Uh, it was uh, extremely physically exhausting. Um, and, and during these uh, visits, she tried to appeal to the uh, local religious and cultural norms to encourage uh, people to take up uh, vaccination uh, if, if the child was not already vaccinated, um, using religious and cultural arguments to make her case. Um, and, and her work was also um, uh, checked upon by a, a supervisor from the World Health Organization. So when, when she found a case, she called up the local center who called up uh, the WHO representative. Uh, and, and the representative was uh, curious why uh, these children were, were unvaccinated. Uh, and, and for the, for the Ashas, um, uh, this was uh, 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 not, not just a consequence of um, uh, local norms, but also uh, a consequence of higher level healthcare actors being unwilling to actually go into these communities and uh, listening to, to the uh, Ashas actually uh, surfacing this, this concern about lack of vaccination for, for a long time. Um, so, so we see sort of uh, uh, several invisible and unpaid workflows um, in the case of Asha's. So how do these uh, workflows connect with the design of AI systems? So a major aspect of Hiba's work was planning and coordinating home visits. Uh, and AI systems have been recommended to help with this, uh, but we, we need to think about uh, how Asha's are already planning workflows, such as by focusing on underserved settings uh, and, and uh, visiting households uh, that are um, uh, that uh, need more support uh, than others, and also revisiting if no one is at home and so forth. Uh, we also need to consider that um, the uh, workflows keep adding on to what Asha's already have on their plate, so we need to treat the workers' time as fixed uh, to avoid uh, in adding to that. 
Uh, and Asha's, uh, like I said, all, were already burdened with workflows, but they also served as uh, key connectors. And this is what a lot of AI systems are relying on, right? So, so they're trying to leverage this position they have uh, to reach a lot of uh, communities. Um, we see though that um, like something like diagnosis is only one part of the many, many workflows that a worker is in, engaged in. So we need to think about how these can be integrated and so for the entire workflow, not just a very narrow uh, piece of it. Um, and the ashas were also responsible for addressing social cultural dimensions of health um, and, and uh, narrow AI systems for diagnosis may end up missing the, the broader reasons why vaccination is not happening, for instance. And more fundamentally, there was a lack of recognition of the work and knowledge of ASHA. So any AI systems that are being deployed need to engage them in design, engage um, their perspectives more deeply and surface their concerns as much as possible. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, not go, to, go into the political context into too much detail, but uh, this is just to say that uh, we do need to consider the political context and the site has also been uh, a, a place of protest uh, against government data collection for, uh, for uh, uh, political reasons. Next, Neha will, yeah. Okay, so what are the takeaways of this work, right? And I want to first iterate that, um, uh, reiterate that that a lot of these takeaways, I think we could apply in other contexts as well, and we have seen them show up in other contexts as well. Um, but there's a few reasons why we uh, stress these. A, it's, it's because it is in the context of um, frontline health and so what these principles look like in the case of frontline health could be slightly different naturally than in other uh, domains and second um, there's there's need for more voices that are kind of stressing these uh, notions uh, so that we have more people who are uh, focusing on these issues in these different domains and so that's really uh, our primary motivation to kind of uh, patch this gap between what's being done and what could be done in the case of frontline health. Um, so with that, let me just go over a summary of kind of the main points and, and certainly you can read the paper for more detail. Uh, so many of the challenges that we uncovered, uh, right, talk to kind of the, uh, the technological interventions, the successes and the failures. And uh, the first thing that we wanted to highlight is the need to foreground uh, user agency. So we must expect targeted users, so to speak, and this again goes back to the complication of the term user, as, uh, as Fayel mentioned in the first talk. So uh, these users could be people who don't use these systems at all or use them in unexpected ways or work around the systems altogether. In the case of frontline health, uh, it may involve not requiring the health workers to actually use the diagnostic systems provided or allowing them to direct when and how they should be used or refusing use altogether, right? So how much of that freedom is really available to these health workers? Many of these ICT systems are also motivated by the promise of scale to help leapfrog uh, development. And there's always this narrative of scale that accompanies all of the AI that we hear about. And so we need to critically question the unit, the nature of scale. For example, in the case of frontline health, AI could treat the time of health workers as fixed and maximize this time on care work rather than mundane workflows. So trying to achieve large scale also brings complications when AI systems frequently rely on large scale data sets to work, but they may not do very well when they are translated across contexts, right? So thinking more deeply about what that scale means and what is the thing that we are trying to scale is important. Uh, we also recommend the move towards uh, supporting self-determination by communities on the development and the use of AI. So one approach for researchers is to work closely with the community over the long term through methodological approaches such as action research and offering technical support after the project ends. And so in this case, we found that there are cases where there might be a close association with communities, but it isn't necessarily with the right stakeholders, as we would put it. And so thinking about what that community-based involvement means may actually need people who are expert in methods such as community-based participatory research. Um, we also need to think about sustainability in terms of resource extraction. 
So first and foremost, we should consider non-technical solutions first. And if AI is still the approach that should be taken, then strategies uh, could be used to streamline, to leverage existing data flows instead of using uh, or introducing new ones. So build systems that require less data, be directed about collecting data only when required. So being really careful and intentional about the data that is generated instead of having an approach of more data always being better. Um, we also need to foster solidarity and exchange knowledge across disciplines and across geographies. So many of the papers that we reviewed asked narrow questions. For instance, they could ask, how well can we predict a disease given a, um, a particular data set? Rather than, why are patients unable to access treatment for the disease in the first place? So it, it's also a question of these, these questions uh, that we're asking, and that also has to do with looking across uh, disciplines and, and disciplinary backgrounds. So we need to build these collaborations to come up with more effective approaches for this AI that is necessarily going to be introduced for, for that to be uh, uh, effective. And we recommend fo focusing on common struggles that communities are facing when thinking about translating systems across contexts. So in the case of frontline health, this could be the global struggle of frontline health workers for better pay and recognition. So really visibilizing the work that they're uh, doing, and that is uh, also going to be Azra's focus moving forward. And uh, translation can also take place from the global south to the north, and this is something that we need to question. And also, I want to say, uh, question what we're really counting as the global south and the north, because it's not true that these uh, boundaries are just uh, geographic. They're also uh, metaphorical. And uh, what work is needed to go from the understanding of global south being a geographical region to going to um, a broader, a, a metaphorical understanding, that also needs to be done. And technical interventions uh, that have been required to be, you know, resource constrained because of the constrained resources, uh, that could also be a strategy to adopt in the global north effectively. And most importantly, uh, you know, to, to end on this note, we need to build solidarities with scholars, with designers, with stakeholders and policy makers. And everyone needs to really come together to address a shared struggle. But solidarity isn't born out of nothing. There is a need to, to really think about what it would mean to respect different epistemic backgrounds and different uh, priorities, different uh, uh, incentive mechanisms and such. So with that, um, we come to the end of our talk. Uh, sorry if we've gone over. I don't actually see the time, unfortunately. Um, and with that, we can open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Azra and Neham. And those are very lovely illustrations to see in the presentation. Uh, we have so one Azra. question. We have one question yes. from our audience. Uh, what are the findings of the pilot study and focus groups you did? So, um, so the so we did we haven't done like a pilot study on an AI system. Uh, what we did is uh, some uh, participatory design sessions, uh, some initial ones with frontline health workers, and this is more of the work that uh, my dissertation focuses uh, on uh, exploring more deeply, uh, but. I mean, the, the interesting thing with these is that uh, a lot of times the uh, for the frontline health worker, what doesn't matter is the specific technology that's being used. It's more of what value this system is offering them in their work. And uh, one particular system uh, that, that I was exploring with them was um, uh, a tool for uh, determining babies that are low birth weight uh, versus those that are not. Uh, and something that came up um, in that particular uh, case of AI was uh, that um, it wasn't really replacing a workflow that uh, they, they had an issue with, uh, and it wasn't integrating with, with their existing workflow. So, so these are the kinds of things that will come up if, if you're actually trying to uh, integrate some of these technologies into the field. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Um, what, are, what was the role of social media application in ASHA engagement for dialogue towards the working condition? Mm -hmm. Another subsequent question is, what role does social media play in empathy in ASHA? 
any particular uh, insight from on field observation with this visa yeah. i'm sorry i lost i didn't hear the last sentence so um, you said. what role does social media play in mpp among ashas and any particular insight mm -hmm. from on field observation yeah um so i mean social and, uh, media is a really powerful tool a lot of uh, what we saw in the field was organizing among the ashas uh, in worker unions and this is happening not just in delhi it's actually happening across india there are a lot of state unions where workers are advocating for better pay for recognition um and a lot of this has also uh, really emerged in mainstream media during the covid uh, pandemic um and whatsapp it has been a, a big platform for for a lot of that organizing work um in terms of um you know what social media can do uh, for for building empathy i think uh, there are some great initiatives that have been taking place recently so there's a non-profit organization called behen box that has been uh, uh, recording stories from ashas in different states and and sharing that publicly and and uh, another um, organization called women in global health um, has uh, and and they have a chapter in india and and in many other countries but the india chapter uh, i've been following closely and they've been doing these panels with uh ashas and other frontline health workers and uh the the union presidents and policy makers and doctors so so really trying to bring everyone uh, on the same platform and again a lot of this has been publicized through facebook through instagram through twitter um so these are really really powerful ways of uh, trying to build solidarity with with the workers so there was a question in the chat like kind of related to this that if you could give an example of an ai application that has worked or can work in the existing system that we already have i mean i i guess we we heard the wise talk and i think that really details what you can do with an action research um, type approach and um, it really uh, i think i mean there's no there's going to be no like one size fits all solution if if that's what the question is asking <laughs> like what to work on it it i don't think works by that way you need to really think about the context that you're uh, trying to address um and and even within india you will see differences in urban and and rural context you'll see uh, differences within an urban context like the uh, region we studied um i mean the ashas i talked to we had uh, ashas working in muslim majority regions and and hindu majority regions and and different uh, class caste uh, uh, sort of uh, build a um, makeup of the of the regions and even there at that level there were differences in how they approached challenges in their communities and and the kinds of interventions they came up with i mean what what we need to do is um, think of where where we can uh, uh actually see similarity so i think like across the board what we have seen is that health workers are are frustrated with just low pay and and not getting recognition uh and and if there is i don't know if ai is is the solution we want here but um maybe a uh, better data about uh, uh the extent of of this uh, workload the extent of the exploitation um, could could offer some some powerful uh, tools to to uh, address uh policy changes here thank you yeah and speaking of policy there is like a related question in the q and a panel as well like how did the asha workers react to privacy concerns such as the national health stack or the aadhaar to yeah. stands for registration like how can we foster trust in policy Yeah okay great question this is a slide i skipped uh, due to lack of time <laughs> but um so so the region that we studied uh, uh was actually um one of the places where you had a lot of uh, protests against the national register for um uh, uh, citizens and and the uh, new citizen citizenship uh, policy that was uh, being proposed by the government back in um, december of 2019 and in fact a lot of the ashas were also engaged in in these protests these are ashas that i know personally um and and what's interesting is that um there there are of course these privacy concerns um what's happening also is that 
we see different political and data systems being linked together. So, so NRC linked to Aadhaar, which is also being linked to National Health Stack. Um, and uh, we already have uh, ASHAs uh, trying to register citizens uh, onto Aadhaar. So this was the case with the ASHAs that I was interacting with. They were uh, they were told uh, by uh, the government health actors to be uh, getting people uh, to register. Um, so, so there is this uh, tension where the ASHA sort of have an in-group status in their communities, uh, and that's leveraged to collect data from them. Um, at the same time, that could uh, conflict with personal uh, values uh, uh, and also like uh, there were uh, communities that just refused to give data to, to ASHAs because uh, they were concerned about where it's going. They had little faith in the government system. So, so we do see a lot of uh, those things happening increasingly now where people uh, refuse to, to give their data if um, uh, that's uh, uh, something that they're against. So I think just uh, one thing that can help is better um, a better data literacy, certainly, but also just um, like thinking about data ownership and, and where uh, the ownership lies. Uh, is it with the community who's giving the data or, or the individual household that's giving the data or the ASHA that's collecting the data? Or is it uh, finally the, the just the government who's going to maintain control and ownership over this? So um, even that, I think, is an open question. And, and that's something that can be explored in further research. Yeah, I think this ties in nicely with what Marianne was talking about earlier, like who will own the data, who will get to decide exactly, on it, yeah. and who will set the rules and regulations. And speaking of rules and regulations, I see Pranjal has promoted everyone to panelists. So anyone who wishes to join the discussion, you can open your mic or video and we could have a discussion for a few minutes if you do not have to run off anywhere else. Yes, I'm yes. Uh, so we, we could request uh, Shaima, Bibi, uh, Mariani to switch on the video if they wish. Uh, we could have open discussion or anyone in you know, attendee would love to ask or share the experience and the project they are doing it. So right now it's open ended conversation with which we could have it at this point. And it is also about to learn more about each other, get to know virtually. So before we kick start, uh, just love to summarize and then I think we could um, have open-ended discussion. So we, were, we are grateful to start the session with uh, Dr. Pal Arora's keynote, where she, she, where she brought about how to include next billion users through tech. Then we had Marianne who argued that it is important that children should be able to challenge the power of AI and technology in daily life. She brought critical question, um, why we should empower and how and who has the power in the AI. Next, we, uh, we had Divi who shared the empirical work they're doing uh, using uh, AI for social good model. Next from Shamia, we heard how her intervention um, brought change in the SCI curriculum in Africa and posed critical questions and a way forward in bringing SCI education broadly in the Afrikai or other Arab Kai region. Last, we had Azra and Neha uh, who warned us about the street light effect, a typical observational bias. Um, when we search about the, uh, so uh, that occurs when people only search for something where it is easiest to look. And they end up with talking about how we could foreground the user agency and how to include the frontline line health workers in the AI. So this is a, a just about what we discussed today. Moving on, what are, are your reflections? Are there something which is missing point? How we should move forward for the next webinar? What are the takeaways? Uh, we could all discuss open end at this point. Take another five minutes of our time. Yes, um, Pushkal has a point. Yeah, Pushkal, you could go ahead. And yeah, this is how we could do. We, people could raise their hands or yeah, that would be better. Yeah. Everyone, I'm Pushkal Agrawal. I'm from King's College, uh, finally a PhD student. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Very interesting and following all through. Now, my question is more towards like what we discussed in the last talk. Uh, maybe Neha or Isra can talk about that. It's about digital literacy. 
because uh, what i see in uh, working research uh, it's not only like people are not aware of digital platforms but they are also getting like uh, tracked or basically tricked so they are like whatsapp kind of platforms where it's not monitored you get uh, messages of like fake news or spams or like sending money i mean so i would like to know uh, maybe from your survey or something like how we can come up with this kind of lit digital literacy in india in terms of like citizen engagement does this make sense actually yeah yeah so i i wanted to say that that's something that um the work of uh, uh pushpinder singh and and his students uh, they've looked at in a recent cscw paper i think it's cscw right i i it's it's a recent paper so i haven't actually seen it but anupriya uh, is on it as well and and a, a few other students from the lab so maybe anupriya if you can add the the title of the paper in the in the chat window um but basically um uh i, I mentioned that because it goes into more depth in terms of what what really counts as digital literacy um and uh that's a question that also came up when we were looking at the social media uses i mean as right you can say more about that if you want um so i mean so the question was around building digital literacy is right and um i think it's it's happening pretty organically right now um it's um it's not just i mean it's not something that um you can you can just expect to roll out a program and then everyone is uh, suddenly digitally literate uh, because you have a lot of uh, gender and and class and and caste and all of these different intersections that determine um, and and age uh, that determine who has access to devices and and how they come online uh, and what their interactions are uh, like when they go online uh, so i think it's it's not just about that what could help is uh, perhaps um, i mean and this this is some of the work um, that you've seen across a lot of global south context but this is a lot of work on uh, data privacy on on online safety so building better uh, online spaces that that are safer more open that's one piece that i think could be more maybe directly uh, addressed um, it's harder to address uh something like access uh, which which is more to do with these social cultural dimensions and and neha probably has has a better answer here i just no i, I would say that there's a lot of um, work you know nova uh, uh nitya uh maria mustafa the, uh, these folks have been working on more recently which i think might might speak directly to the question of digital literacy so Yep. I just wanted to add the names of the researchers. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Pushkar. I was wondering if Shaima or Marian had any like thoughts on data literacy on these topics as well. Well, uh I'd say that it's uh, my answer to everything is education. <laughs> so, um, but of course that's it's an easy answer but how to do it that's totally different and for example uh in india and south asian countries i know this is a situation sort of the practical situation but that's that's the same situation in in also in africa and uh and actually i would say that of course of course even though though uh sort of the general situation in 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 education in general is great for example in finland uh, but still i would say that it's it's really important in any country to increase uh, our well everybody's but especially children's understanding of of like data literacy ai literacy whatever we want to call it i i could even call it technology literacy so 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 i think that there are different kinds of um, computational empowerment is something that is talked about computational thinking so imp computational empowerment is a, is a newer term but anyway i think that they all try to uh, communicate 
that it's more and more important for everybody to understand how technology works in our lives. And there are many different um, angles to that. So there is AI, there is, there is data in general, but the, how the technology is developed, what should I think about technology, like being reflective and so all, all sorts of things. And, um, but it's also a huge challenge because we, it's, it's easy to say, we, we can always put everything like, okay, you have to put it in education. Okay, in schools. But poor teachers, how they can do it when they don't have uh, education themselves from technology field? So how should they do it? And so on. So, so it's easy to say, but the answer is much more difficult. So, but anyway, education is always my answer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one thing i can add on top of it uh, is basically uh, like the laws the privacy laws because in one study that we got uh, just accepted at icwsm this year it talks about how user are tracked like everywhere and they like in indian context news channels get like thousand cookies and because the privacy laws are not that good and users are also not that aware they they don't feel uh, that they are getting tracked but it's a lot of data that is being collected just because the privacy laws or the government is not like into it. Did you notice a recent um, news related to Google changing the system? I didn't read about it carefully enough, yeah. but anyway, so this, um, they changed the ad ad system and how they follow people or they will change at least that's interesting what will happen yeah yeah so i'm just thinking that it might be that uh parts of the things that we are now worried it might be that uh, like european gdpr regulation might uh actually cause these tech giants to change what they do because they are kind of in trouble and it might be that it helps also the rest yeah. of the world which would be great of course let's see yeah. yeah and as i see like india is a very different context so it's a mobile first country so we use a lot of like uh, like websites on mobile and in mobile we don't have ad blockers we don't have antivirus uh, those kind of challenges also come into picture so but yeah thanks everyone for such a nice uh, discussion and I will check the links. Thank you. So it's already uh, 7.55. Um, uh, feel free to drop out as it, uh, as it is going to be late as per the Indian time. Um, but if someone wants to hang out, you could do more uh, another five minutes and then close this Zoom meeting. Show me any last thoughts, any from anything from you, or someone else would love to say something in the end. Well, I, I might have one last thought about the talk about privacy and uh, digital literacy. So I agree with Azra that some of the these literacies really grow organically. When I started working with the Bedouin community. Uh, many of them don't really read and write very well, but they are very fluent in using their mobile phones. And um, as with uh, the come the latest WhatsApp uh, privacy concern and um, agreement, what happened is like I heard um, about WhatsApp and the concerns about WhatsApp uh, from people around me who are not fluent with the technology. Uh, before I even like kind of really had the time to read the uh, the about the the, the new um, uh, the, the new regulation and, and everything, so what happens is even if you're very uh, uh, literate in in that, you probably have access to a network of people who will tell you if that matters to you since you're using technology. So it's, it's just you you're not in isolation in, in complete isolation, so to speak. There is also around you an ecosystem uh, that. Uh, uh, 
kind of nurture your use of technology, so to speak. And I have seen that with the with the Bedouin families when there is someone who's really good with the technology and they pick up what we uh, tell them or the kind of mobile app that would try to work with them and then go to the rest of the family and uh, spread the news and everything. So it's not, so it could be education, doesn't have to be formal education, but also education within the the community or education even within the family uh, that could happen and, and solve the issue and, and really things could grow in, in a way that we haven't imagined. And of course, there is the long uh, fix for that is like how we account for that when we design um, things or, or we tell people about, uh, to ex try to explain to them AI uh, in our designs. Yeah, one example of the community education was that who was making these posters about the coronavirus myths that were circulating. And I saw that at least in our town, they were pasted on buses then public transport and other public places to show people that these are the myths, you should not believe in them versus that. So maybe something for AI and data literacy could also be. But this again takes a policy perspective and what people are willing to do about it. And you've uh, seen some of that kind of um, uh, promotion uh, for for healthcare, different kind of like health campaigns where you have um, um, like Bollywood actors and and all of these uh, look and local celebrities are talking about uh, different kinds of health behaviors and and I imagine a lot of that would be trans translated to other uh, kinds of challenges like you know how how you should be using these these uh, online platforms, what are things you need to look out for and all of that. Uh, the challenge is actually getting the stakeholders to take that seriously and actually adopt that as, as a platform uh, that uh, they want to promote. That's, that's I think, the, the big challenge. And same, same with like actually translating that then into policy, right? Like there, there are people who are doing a lot of lobbying to try and um, get this to happen in India. It's just going to take time. Right. Um, thank you all. Thank you all the speakers, uh, um, Professor Payal Arora, Marianne, Divi, Shamia, Azra, Neha for sharing experience today. And thank you all the attendees who stayed back uh, long. And we would be coming back in uh, most probably 23rd of April uh, with our next session on AI. And a um, couple of more announcements. In the starting, we were also sharing about the uh, Kai workshop. Uh, so if you're still interested to attend our Kai workshop, we will share the details on the email. And the good part is that the early bird registration have been pushed to 16th April. So that might give uh, more leverage to attend the Kai conference this year. Hopefully we, in the, in there, there was a small glitch in the starting. We were not able to present properly. Um, and, the, and, and the last point to end on is to add is also about the Sikai president election, which are, I'm sorry, the Sikai elections, which are just coming up. Um, and whosoever is a Sikai member would probably be getting the email and uh, look up and be available there to vote. Um, thank you, uh, Shaima, Neha, Azra, for staying with us. And yes, I see in the chat that people are asking how to contribute to endeavor you are most welcome to connect with us and maybe participate in the Kai workshop or even later like just reach out to us and we can work things out this initiative is supposed to be a community in can the I first ask a quick question about yeah. that do you require anything for participation or can anybody just show up there is no requirement as such it's just that uh, sikha membership is required um, because, uh, but that that does not hinder anyone to contribute to the community. Uh, if anyone wants to organize something, wants to take up lead, uh, want to get mentorship, uh, this Escape South Asia is also primarily also promote is also looking to promote students and early career researchers who want to develop their career in SCI and design. Um, so there is no barrier, uh, but. Six time membership will, will just help them to get into conferences, different uh, which different benefits which come with the Sikai. But for the SF of South Asia, we are not making any barriers.
So I think the Sikai membership was only for the Kai workshop, right? Yes, that's yes. Uh, when whenever we do anything inside the conference yeah. or related to Sikai, their Sikai membership comes handy. Yeah. Comes handy, but it's not required. I want to say. Right. And the whole agenda is that we move out of our own small bubble of SCI. There are many more scientists, social scientists, uh, many more dis discipline uh, who could benefit from SCI for South Asia, and SCI for South Asia could benefit from them. Right? So that's the intention that anyone who's interested should come and be part of it in any way. Thank you so, so much for doing this, for putting it all together, and for so much effort, uh, all of you that put in, Pranjal, uh, Nilagar, uh, Anupriya, Sumita. I know that there are others as well. I don't know. Rahad. Thank you, Neha. Thank you for supporting us. Um, we look forward to the election as well and supporting you with big crowd thank you for organizing this was um i mean i would love to hear from more people in in future events and i guess um i'm looking forward to the workshop as well to do that okay okay um okay then we'll meet soon again we will meet again for the Expo D, which is happening on 20th April or something? 20th April, yeah. It's on um, private messaging in social media, uh, privacy and participation social media. So, yes, I will send out an email soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.